Hey, I'm Dan Harris. If you had told me several years ago that I ever would have written a book about meditation, I would have coughed my beer up through my nose. But funny things happen, and in this little video clip, I'm going to tell you the weird and windy story of how I went from hardened skeptic to daily and, and rather public meditator. It all started with a panic attack on national television. It happened in the year 2004 on a little show called Good Morning America. I was filling in as what's known as the newsreader. That's the person who comes on at the top of each hour and reads a series of headlines. I'd actually done this job many times before, so I had no reason to foresee what was about to happen, which was that I was overtaken by an irresistible bolt of fear. A few seconds into my spiel, my heart started racing, my mind started racing, my palms started sweating, my mouth dried up, my lungs seized up. I just couldn't breathe. I couldn't go on. I couldn't talk for at least five years may also lower their risk for cancer, but it's too early to, to prescribe statins slowly for cancer production. At this point, I realize I'm helpless, so I bail right in the middle. Uh, that does it for news. We're going to go back now to Robin and Charlie. I had to do something that I had never done before in my career, which has quit right in the middle. And there's a backstory here which is even more embarrassing. I think at the root of this panic attack was something that a lot of us share, which is a desire to be great at whatever it is we do. I arrived at ABC News at the age of 28. They took a picture of me on my first day on the job. Um, I looked terrified. I was working with giants like Peter Jennings, Diane Sawyer, and Barbara Walters, and I was really self-conscious about the fact that I was green. My way of compensating was to become a workaholic. I just threw myself into the job. Shortly after I arrived, 9-11 uh, happened, and I volunteered to go overseas and cover whatever happened next, frankly, without thinking much about the psychological consequences. And I spent many years in places like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Israel, the West Bank, Gaza, and I made six or seven trips to Iraq. When I got home from one of those trips, uh, I got depressed. And uh, embarrassingly, I didn't even know I was depressed although I was exhibiting what I now know to be some of the classic signs. I was having trouble getting out of bed. I felt like I had a low-grade fever all the time. And at this point, I did a toweringly stupid thing, which is I started to self-medicate with recreational drugs, including cocaine and ecstasy. Now, to be clear, it wasn't like the Wolf of Wall Street. I wasn't doing it every day. I definitely wasn't doing it when I was working, definitely not when I was on the air. As I like to say, I was stupid, but not that stupid. After the panic attack, though, I went to go see a shrink, an expert in panic, and he asked me a series of questions to try to get to the root of the problem, and one of them was, do you do drugs? To which I rather sheepishly said, yeah, I do. At that point, he sort of leaned back in his chair and gave me a look that said, okay, idiot, mystery solved. He explained that even though I wasn't doing drugs every day, it was enough to raise the level of adrenaline in my brain and prime me to have that panic attack. Now, this isn't one of these neat, tidy stories where I realize what a moron I'd been and then immediately embrace meditation, and then my life becomes a nonstop parade of unicorns and rainbows. There were a lot of strange and unforeseen developments, which I talk about in my book, 10% Happier, that ultimately led me to meditation. I won't lie, when I initially was introduced to the subject of meditation, I thought it sounded uh, unbelievably annoying. I agreed with Alec Baldwin's character on 30 Rock, who said that meditation is a waste of time, like learning French or kissing after sex. I'm kidding, by the way. Uh, but then I did some research, and I found that there's been an enormous amount of scientific research into meditation in recent years, and it shows that it's incredibly good for you. Everything from lowering your blood pressure to boosting your immune system to literally rewiring key parts of your brain. Let me tell you about one study that was done at Harvard in 2010 took people who had never meditated before and scanned their brains. And then over the course of the next eight weeks, they gave these people short daily doses of meditation. At the end of those eight weeks, they scanned their brains again. And they found that the area of the brain associated with compassion and self-awareness, the gray matter literally grew. And in the area of the brain associated with stress, the gray matter literally shrank. Pretty compelling stuff. And then I learned something else, which is that meditation, despite my misconceptions, does not involve joining a group or believing in anything in particular, that it's actually simple, secular brain exercise. We have another clip up on the site here where you can learn how to do it. I started doing five to 10 minutes a day, not a big investment of time, 
And pretty quickly, within weeks, I started to see three main benefits. One, it boosted my ability to focus. I have a very hectic job in the news business. I sometimes have other people's voices literally piped into my own ear. And I have to focus under a lot of pressure and make sure I get the story right and that I do it quickly. And the daily exercise of sitting and trying to focus on my breath and getting lost and starting over, getting lost and starting over, helped me focus on my job. The second benefit was that it just created a, an increased sense of calm in my life. Stepping out of the traffic for a couple of minutes a day and just focusing on my breathing made me just a little bit more calm in the rest of my life. It didn't transform me immediately into the Dalai Lama, but it just made me a little bit more calm. And the third benefit is something called mindfulness, which we discuss in yet another of the clips on the site. But basically, it made me a less reactive to the voice in my head. So I was less likely to do things like eating when I wasn't hungry or losing my temper when it was not in my best interest or checking my phone when my wife was trying to talk to me. In the end, as I say in my book, it made me 10% happier. That's obviously an absurd, unscientific estimate, but I like it because it's true enough and it also it sounds like a pretty good return on investment. Now, if my wife had the microphone right now, she would give you the 90% still a moron speech. Uh, and my younger brother uh, suggested that we actually retitle the book uh, From Deeply Flawed to Merely Flawed. The point being, this isn't something that's going to fix everything in your life. I've learned from hard experience that it's not going to regrow your hair or make you taller, but it can make a significant difference. And let me finish here with my little tagline, which is, if it can work for a fidgety, skeptical newsman, it can work for you.